Arts of Fartos back in town, baby. We're going to talk about something that's been grinding my gears a little bit. And it's the way that people talk about people who they vaguely understand the existence of, but have not really interfaced with themselves. And it's something that I'm a huge victim of because when I hear people talk about me online, it is always describing someone who, you know, to my mind, does not resemble who I am. And there are constantly people out there sort of explaining to one another, like people who are paying attention to me, explaining where the, the disconnect is to other people. Because, you know, people who are following my content closely, who've heard me talk about a lot of different subjects, who really understand, like, my opinions... Uh, in a holistic sense, understand sort of the complications and the nuance in what I'm saying. And there are a lot of people who basically just overhear, uh, you know, a, a, a version of what I'm putting forward. And, you know, because of the fact that they've already heard these negative things about me, then if they hear anything that kind of affirms that belief, then they latch on to it. And you can see this on a lot of different strata. It's like, in a political sense, there are people who are like, oh, Digibro th thinks this or that politically, which sounds nothing like anything I believe. Or it could be about anime. It could be that I think this or that about anime that is not even close to what I believe. Or, or just, you know, people outright not getting the content I make. And I mean, this is the Whirling Dervish podcast. Most of the people listening to this podcast seem to be more of my very hardcore followers who really understand what I'm on about. Like, they, they've got a pretty good perspective. So, like, I don't think anybody listening to this podcast would have had difficulty understanding, for instance, that my JoJo video was intended to be funny. Like, there are people out there who really think that in that video where I'm screaming at the top of my lungs with a big smile on my face about how I'm not okay and this is Garbaggio, that that, that person whose entire career is made out of making like very mild-mannered, deeply thought-out visual analysis of anime, like whose who's basically one purpose is to like describe how things do or don't look good, and like... This video is a drunken follow-up to a stream that, unfortunately, my stream recording was taken down so that, you know, the, the sort of evidence of what got us to this video was, was lost, but, uh, you know, it was just me getting drunk watching the Crunchyroll Awards and then making this follow-up video to, like, uh, basically antagonize the chat who I had been arguing with through the awards show. So, uh, you know, this, this video that was made to be funny was suddenly, you know, picked up by a much larger audience than I would have expected. This is a random, drunken, insane vlog. I would have thought it got 2,000 views of people who were just going to think it was funny. It somehow has 70,000 views and a huge dislike bar and a bunch of people who think that I'm like this psychopath who, who thinks that I'm proving that JoJo has bad character designs by pointing at stupid-looking background art. That's the joke! Like, <laughs> so, you know... I look at that level of misinterpretation that can happen, and then I see how it happens to other people. How I see, even amongst people who get my content and where it's coming from, who themselves have heard things about other creators and sort of internalized their understanding of that creator's position. So a great example of this would be uh, Dick Masterson, a podcaster who I'm a huge fan of, who I've worked with, who I've been to his house. I think he's, first of all, I just want to say that I think Dick is a really incredible person in general. He's extremely, uh, you know, kind. He has helped tons of people. He's put tons of people on the map. He's helped tons of people to launch careers. He's built an entire Patreon alternative. Uh, you know, he's been extremely graceful to people like me who are fans. You know, this is a guy who puts on live shows and then hangs out with his fans all night in town. Uh, I just think, you know, as a as a human being, I find him to be a, a decent guy, even though I know that he, deep down in his heart of hearts, is also a scumbag who has, you know, who who's, who's like, you know, he's currently sort of turned over a leaf of being a hero, but it's not that that's innately who he is all the time, you know? But nonetheless, I have a lot of respect for what 
he's been doing. And this guy, you know, for the most part, depending on who you are, he's very beloved. Like, in the eyes of a certain sector of culture, particularly people who are very protective of free speech, who really want to be able to hear, you know, thoughts from all sides, from all perspectives, and, like, we're not just talking about politics. Like, one of the best things about The Dick Show is its willingness to invite just people who are on the absolute fringes of sanity, essentially. And... But the, the kind of people who come on The Dick Show are the kind of people who are proud of themselves for being the way that they are. They're people who, you know, have really out there fetishes or have done really crazy things to their body or have, you know, uh, just have extreme autism and have difficulty communicating. And these are people who would be just basically brushed off of most shows, kicked out, considered disgusting or, you know, the things that they say would get them shunned by other people. But Dick just listens to them and engages with them and like he makes fun of them but not for being who they are he makes fun of them for the dumb things that they might say or do and most of the time they can take it in stride because they appreciate that they're doing and saying dumb things but it's it's not about the the who they are you know dick sees a successful person in a person who makes money and is happy with themselves regardless of what they believe or how they feel about themselves and i feel the same way you know which is why i'm willing to be such an audacious internet personality why I'm willing to have these really, you know, radical stances on things that I truly believe in and to sort of out myself as thinking those things and, you know, uh, making my career more difficult by being a controversial figure when I could just as easily have fucking just been an anime YouTuber and never brought up anything political or anything personal at all. But, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the ability that I have to live and be myself and make a profit and, you know, reach people while being this kind of person who, you know, I'm trying to kind of confront society that people like me are here and you created us and you need to fucking help deal with it, you know? <laughs> so, you know, uh, I hear people talking about Dick sometimes and a lot of people just really, he rubs them the wrong way because of his comedy and because of what he sort of stands for, even though a lot of the time I really don't think people understand like what his stuff actually is because Dick is a satirist and he always has been his original book that, you know, made him famous that he and his website was called men are better than women. It is an entire book of just chauvinist slogans back to back that are absolutely absurd and ridiculous. And the comedy of the book is just how insane it sounds. And if anybody takes it seriously, which a lot of people did, and he kept getting his website taken down, like it reflects more on that person's intelligence that they couldn't tell that this is meant to be ridiculous, that these are, that like the statements he makes don't even make sense. It's not even stuff that's grounded in any kind of logic or anything anyone's saying, any part of the rhetoric, you know, other than broad stereotypes. Like he, in, in a lot of the times, the writing just devolves into metatextual nonsense where like it's not even staying in character. It frequently is winking and nodding at you. It frequently is drawing attention to the ridiculousness of what it's stating, you know? And Dick Masterson is, uh, by all accounts and all means, uh, a ladies' man, if anything. Like, he's a guy who absolutely loves women, you know? Um, and has, you know, has women in his life that are very close and important to him, has a great relationship with his mom, you know, with, with you know, the people who stereotypically, the, you know, people who don't get the satire of this book assume that he has poor relationships with because they don't get that it's a joke. It is a joke. It's funny because you could buy into it at all. That's, I mean, it's essentially like Poe's Law, right? That you can't tell the difference between irony and truth on the internet because there are people who really hold the insane beliefs that people will say. But Dick is presenting a character that if you were to believe that this person was real, they would clearly be totally insane. Like, this person is is not communicating anything based in any kind of logic or fact. And when you read it, 
if you don't laugh, then you like if you're taking it seriously, if you're believing that this person is saying these things, you have to be stupid. You just have to be to not get that it's a joke because uh, I mean, even if you thought it was real, you at least would have to just dismiss it as, well, this person's insane. Like, it should be that simple. It should not be that you take this person seriously and, and feel that their message is being spread to the masses because people don't think things that are this ridiculous. And, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to say that all, you know, writing on the internet that sounds anything like dicks would, would necessarily be not serious. I'm saying that nothing reads like it. Like, if you read it, you can see that it's satire. The meta is in the text. And so, you know, going forward, knowing that Dick is a satirist, that part of his, you know, identity is to call attention to weird and bizarre and extreme positions and to kind of poke fun of them in a way that, you know, if you get that it's, po if you get that it's making fun of it, it's extremely funny. And so, for instance, Dick Masterson, who had never voted once in his life, decided to go all in on pushing Donald Trump during the 2016 election because he thought it was funny. And because he's somebody who doesn't take politics very seriously, doesn't really believe in any of the candidates. And I, I want you to keep in mind, like, there's a lot of people who really hate people who feel that way, who, 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 you know, they see it as like, well, it's because of people like you that Trump won. Well, I sincerely want you to consider the idea that there are a lot of people who just think that Hillary would have been even worse. They just think that. And maybe you think they're wrong, but, like, there's a lot of reason to believe that. She's an extremely untrustworthy uh, figure who, you know, has a lot of... Basically, she's, you know, bought and paid for by billionaires who are running this country. And her husband has connections to Jeffrey Epstein and flew on his plane all these times and stuff. And, like, there's just a lot of reasons to not trust the Clintons, to not want a political dynasty of which we already had one with the Bush administration, which a lot of people who like Trump are anti-Bush, you know, or were anti-Bush. So, like, to look at it like, oh, Dick Masterson is right wing because he was, you know, pro-Trump during this election, I think is just a, a wrong-headed, you know, way to look at it. But because of the fact that it, you know, it pisses people off and people take it so seriously, even though from the beginning his presentation of his support of Trump was clearly a joke, clearly had no substantiation in, like, his real, uh, you know, ideals that Trump was going to do something great. Like, he liked some of his ideas, but had no real expectation they'd actually come to fruition. Before the election, he full-on said that if Trump loses, it was all a joke, and if he wins, of course it wasn't, because exactly, it's always been like it's it's never been as important to represent his real opinion as it has been to perform a character that's entertaining that plays off of the things that people care about the things that people are mad about and so I realize that it's it's extremely difficult for people who care a whole lot to like understand or identify with somebody who does not care somebody who sincerely thinks that this thing that you're fighting over is a sham, that it has, you know, that the consequences of the decisions that will be made will not affect you in any way and will make you feel as though, you know, um, you know, even participating in the system is basically just contributing to its ability to continue to exist. And that the only way that the public could ever make you feel like a real sympathy for them is if they rose up and did something about the system, which would be uh, dead easy to do by even just so much as changing the way we vote. So, you know, I really don't buy into this position that Dick is, like, right-wing or that he puts on right-wing voices when he just puts on whoever will come on his show. And back in the day when him and Maddox were doing the show together, they had tons of liberal guests. And, you know, Dick can easily have conversations with those people and respect them and feel a lot of the same ways as them, and politics rarely enters the conversation. Asterios Kokonos was on the show, was heavily affiliated with it for a long time, and he was a, you know, dyed-in-the-wool liberal, uh, very much a Democratic voter his whole life, you know, like, and even me, I'm not a conservative, and I come on his show, and tons of people do, tons of callers call in, and they complain about his politics, but love the show, because, the sh you know, the politics aren't the appeal of it. 
for one thing. And for another thing, you can listen to somebody and enjoy them and agree with some of the things they say without having to whole cloth, agree with everything they believe, and, you know, hold their position as gospel. And sometimes it's interesting to hear the perspectives from people who don't feel the same way as you and to understand their underlying logic. You can combat that logic and further the conversation, but to tell somebody that just because they don't already have the answers you do, they need to shut their mouth is ridiculous. You should be trying to reach that person and get that information into their uh, understanding, you know? Uh, but everybody just wants to silence other people and tell them that they can't talk. I had to take a break for a while to eat dinner, so I'm going to come at this from another angle. This was a quote that stuck with me that I heard recently. I couldn't even remember who had said it. And as soon as I heard who had said it, I realized that it only added to the point I'm going to make. This was a story told by Alex Jones on his show. I saw a clip of this, uh, and, you know, Alex Jones is a guy who is absolutely delightful to listen to. I love listening to Alex Jones. The man is manic, crazy. The the things that he that he says are absurd. And yet he he nonetheless is I don't think he's like a a stupid guy necessarily. I think that a lot of what he believes is couched in something you know, that, that started from a real place, but he extrapolates things to ridiculous degrees. And, you know, as he described himself, I'm a little bit autistic. Uh, I might be a little bit uh, socially retarded as he uh, put it on, <laughs> on the amazing five hour podcast he did with, uh, with Joe Rogan, which of course is still up on YouTube. Um, even though Alex Jones can't be on YouTube, he can't be affiliated with any like mainstream, Press. He's been, you know, he's like one of the first guys to really get deplatformed and, and blacklisted from a bunch of places. And um, he just happened to be big enough that he could continue to support himself. And he takes lots and lots of fucking ad money to, you know, read fucking bullshit pill ads or whatever on his show. But like Alex Jones, anybody can can listen to him and understand that the man is insane. I mean, if you are somebody who falls into the camp of agreeing with him on everything he says, you are also insane. And thankfully, uh, you know, the insane are a minority. We sort of corral and identify and we point at and we laugh. And, uh, you know, it's not that I'm purely only ever laughing at Alex Jones. I think that he is... He capitalizes on his own uh, weird persona in a really interesting and, and entertaining way. He plays into the very thing, you know, the the joke being made on, you know, at about him. And so I, you know, I find him to be entertaining and like I'm glad that he exists because I want to know what people like Alex Jones are thinking about. But you know, this this quote is. Some, so just some, you know, really interesting storytelling, I guess, uh, you know, an interesting comment on the state of things in our society uh, from Alex Jones. And he said that he was he was talking about his stance on um, white nationalism, which he is against. And he was talking about how he one day bought Mein Kampf when he was a teenager from a bookstore so that he could read it. So because he, he was interested in the subject and the mentality of the people who you know, did things like this. And he said that the woman at the counter asked him, like, are you a Nazi? And he said, well, you're selling the book. Are you a Nazi? And, you know, they had a laugh and he bought the book and read it and said it was full of crazy shit. <laughs> you know, basically that was his take on Mein Kampf. Like he literally said, like, it's full of crazy shit. So, you know, that's like a reasonable conclusion to come to for a rational thinker reading this book, knowing the context of who wrote it and, you know, having an interest in why they developed that perspective and being able to see, uh, you know, what was wrong with it and to, to sort of also try to parse why this person was able to convince people. Why was he able to seize power? What, you know, what in this do you have to look out for to understand how to avoid that in the future? You know, we need to be able to study these people. And when you push them away, you really got to understand that we are approaching a, a state in which there will be a secondary Internet. 
where enough people will be shoved off of the mainstream internet that there will just emerge a secondary one, and it, it already exists. It's not like this is some new pipeline we have to build. Peer to peer is a very easy way to you know to send things. And like recently, I had a video that um uh wasn't able to be uploaded to YouTube. Um, it, it just like failed to process a bunch of times, and uh, somebody was like, "Why don't you just uh, send us torrents of your videos?" And I was like, well, you know, I just got to figure out how to do that, which took one second. And so I sent a torrent to some of my followers and I was like, you know, um, if as long as I had a way to get paid for the things that I was sending people as torrents, then, uh, you know, I could send whatever I want. And it would be extremely difficult for payment processors to even, you know, understand that I was doing this or you know, for my content to enter the hands of people who wouldn't appreciate it. You know, I, I could even be selective with who I'm willing to give my content to as long as people were willing to pay for it. And so, like, you know, radical ideas that can't survive on these platforms could easily just develop underground communities that, uh, you know, now nobody knows what the fuck they're doing and thinking. Nobody knows what their operations are unless they become, like, inside agents. And then you've got a whole fucking gay ops, like... Uh, you know, spy versus spy thing going on in a fucking regular everyday human life because people are so fucking passionate about their political opinions on the internet, you know? Like, that's the level of gay opery we are going to get to if we don't just put a stop to this and be reasonable about free speech because it's not fucking dangerous. It is not dangerous. In fact, it is extremely fucking important. It is important that we can go read Mein Kampf and study it and learn from World War II and Hitler. It's important that we can look into his mind as much as possible to grasp what this man did to manipulate this population into doing these heinous things. You know, like... If we can't identify it, how are we going to defeat it? And so we're just driving these people into creating their own, you know, uh, crypto internet that, you know, a lot of it will, I mean, a lot of it is decrypt or, you know, is encrypted. A lot of the really far flung, crazy political shit going on in the line is already behind, you know, uh, behind internet firewalls, you know? So, you know, at what point. Will there be enough people driven underground that it becomes an underground movement that has power and that is invisible to the average person? And how easy will it be for that uh, community to be manipulated, for them to be taken over by, you know, by people with particularly evil interests who, you know, are going to radicalize this group of people who've been taken off the Internet and uh, turn them against society like how easy would that be if there's nobody, you know, from mainstream society to even look at what's going on? So I really think it's important to keep things in visibility, to keep them being commented on. You know, there's a lot of people, a lot of trolls who support uh, people who they troll. There's a reason that, you know, Chris Chan and DSP have successful Patreons that they can somewhat make a living through, uh, you know, aside from when they occasionally do things that piss off their patrons for, you know, legitimate reasons and lose a bunch of support. But, like, people will support you because of the fact that they are, you know, they're entertained by you one way or another. And it doesn't mean that you agree with that person. It doesn't mean that you support that person in terms of, uh, you know, wanting their ideas to get out there, or wanting to support their lifestyle. You just want to uh, keep them visible so that you can continue to be entertained by their existence, you know, by the stupid things that they say and think and believe or, you know, whatever mockery they make of themselves. And some of these people really don't deserve to be mocked and uh, or, you know, nobody really deserves to be, you know, to be made fun of all the time. But like, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a lens to these people as a way of understanding ourselves and our surroundings and like what's going on in the world, you know, because like when we really, when we understand people on the fringe, we get a better sense of like what our society is doing to people. I'm a huge fan of the channel Down the Rabbit Hole, for instance, like the stories that he tells about these people uh, and he's, you know, he's 
almost sympathetic. He's never really uh, mocking the subjects of his videos at all. He doesn't take a, a jeering tone the way that Mr. Medeker does, um, you know, while doing a similar type of content, but, uh, or, you know, porcelain who also does a similar type of content, but, you know, in their cases, they're definitely making fun of the people they talk about. Uh, in the case of, uh, Frederick Knudsen, he, you know, is just sort of examining these people as a way of seeing, like, what do these certain, you know, mental conditions that certain people have or the way that society, uh, you know, functions or treats people of these certain types, like, what happens to them and what can we learn from those experiences, you know, and uh, how can we maybe even help in the future with these people, you know, being able to live better lives or whatever. So, like, you know, Again, in in the case of Frederick Knudsen, it's not as though he's, like, supporting these people financially and helping them to exist the way that, you know, some trolls might do. But, like, it's – I think it is interesting to, to, you know, to keep these people in the limelight. And there's always people who try to help. Anytime – anybody who gets bullied online, there is always a counterforce of people trying to help. A lot of these people do not listen to that shit. A lot of people don't listen to the people who are trying to help them. They don't listen to the people who, you know, who are trying to get them on to the right course. They're just angry and, you know, they're, they're, they're only paying attention to the people who are saying negative things, you know. But in any case, returning to what I said about Alex Jones and his quote about the, the bookstore, uh, there was a very similar quote from a recent Don Jolly video where he was showing off uh, the Encyclopedia.Zone library, episode number one, just, you know, showing off some of the cool books that he has that have interesting stories behind them. And at one point, he brings out a holy Bible. Now, he was a religious studies major in uh, college, and he currently writes about the religion of politics as his major series in a satirical shitposting lens, um, you know, on Encyclopedia.Zone. So he had a Bible around his house at a time, and his roommate at one point got, like, afraid and was like, are you becoming like a Jesus guy, like a God dude? You know, like he was worried that he was becoming like a weird Christian guy. And, you know, Don was just kind of like, look, you know, I'm just reading this for information. Like you can't fear, you know, the consumption of information that it's going to somehow transform you and your beliefs, that you're automatically going to side with whatever you view even if you enjoy it and you get something out of it, that you're automatically just going to become this thing that, you know, is represented wholesale. And I think that there are plenty of people who can very much, you know, compartmentalize the different sides of a person and say, like, well, I agree with him on these things and I disagree on these things. And I mean, just look at my comment section where that's half the comments I get on all my videos is, you know, I don't agree with Digibro on everything, but this video, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, why do you need to qualify that? Like, of course we don't agree on everything. There's nobody with whom I agree on everything. I don't agree with May on everything. I don't agree with my family on everything. I don't agree with my own self. I don't agree with posts I made two years ago on my own opinions, you know? Like, I, yeah, of course we don't agree on everything. That's not the point. Take each thing as it comes. I agree with this point that he said, it doesn't matter how I feel about the rest of the shit he said. I mean, this is kind of exactly why 4chan was built on that whole anonymity principle of that everything has to stand on its own because, you know, it, it protects this from happening. Not only can people not say, oh, I agree with him because it's him, but they also can't say, you know, oh, I disagree with him because he said this once. It's like every idea stands on its own and, and you know, lives or dies on whether people agree with it or, you know, the arguments that are had. And a lot of the time 4chan gets accused of having like a specific stance on things, even though all 4chan is, is arguing all the fucking time. Like the entire website is dedicated to aggressive back and forth arguing of every different position. If you go on poll, which is like infamous for having white nationalists and stuff, there's also a bunch of like liberal people on there arguing their side with those people. Now, granted, 
made on a lot of platforms, those extremist views just would not be allowed to even have a voice. But like here, you can see them debated. You can choose who you agree with based on the data that they bring up, and both sides bring data to the table. Both of them are having serious arguments about these subjects, and other people are saying, just silence anyone who believes the, the thing that we disagree with, you know? And uh, there's always going to be, like, every time you kick somebody else off and say, like, well, this person crossed the line. Well, where's the line? Because the line is different every time. People are getting blocked for different things. How do I know where the line is? Nobody's clearly defined the line. Some things seem to be crossing the line if this guy says it, but not if this guy says it. Hmm, I'm noticing that you can get away with a lot of things unless a certain number of people complain about you and the platform doesn't want to have to face a potential PR disaster, so they kick you to make themselves look good. And, uh, you know, that's just cowardly shit. And people are always spouting this nonsense about how businesses exist to make money. They have to do what they have to do. No, they fucking don't. Businesses are built on the philosophy of the people who fucking run them. If you, as a business owner, don't have the mindset of constant growth and need to appease shareholders because you don't have shareholders, you just run a fucking business, then you are at your own will. Guess what? I'm a fucking small business owner. I own a business called DigiBro. I make a lot of fucking money doing it, and I don't need to make any more. I don't try to grow my channel. Obviously, anybody looking at my channel could say, this guy is letting his sub count drop because he makes so much fucking money that he doesn't need to spread anymore. And if he did, he has plenty of options for how to make that happen. You know, like, that... It, it, people can't wrap their head around the idea that you just are comfortable and, you know, are, are making decisions on the basis of your beliefs and not on the basis of, you know, what's going to make you the most money. And I understand that, like, you know, we hate corporations, and I hate corporations, I hate mega corporations. I hate billionaires, I hate that mentality of constantly needing to make more money, I hate all those, that brand of capitalism, but, like, people who are just doing their, you know, just doing a thing to provide a service and get, you know, be able to make a living for providing a service, which is what a job is supposed to be. You're supposed to be, you know, and even in a communist society, like, the idea would be that you... You, you, you know, you make shoes and therefore you get to live. And, you know, in a free market economy, the value of those shoes is determined by how much people are willing to pay for them. So, you know, you have uh, different ways of making your stuff seem worthwhile to to pay for, you know, be that through literal the quality of what it is or the necessity of having it or through it, uh, you know, branding and advertising and making it look good. So, like, you know, if you don't have the mentality of needing constant growth, there's no need to to be deceitful in your practices. There's no need to, uh, you know, appease the larger audience in, you know, over actually helping the creators on your platform. Because everything Patreon's doing just makes things worse for creators. If you're blocking anybody, if you're, you know, setting this bar down further and further, all it means is that we're, everybody's closer and closer to the chopping block. And when you run a platform based entirely on supporting niche, edgy media, which even the, you know, the far left stuff on Patreon, like, come town is extremely edgy media that survives on the platform. But, you know, if you're edgy and you're kind of in with the wrong crowd, then you get kicked. And it's... It's baffling because it's so transparent and I really don't believe that Patreon has their fingers on the pulse of who any of these people are, how they're interconnected, the actual conversation being had. I think they just hear complaints. They hear complaints from people who want this stuff taken down and they listen to those complaints because, yeah, like you guys are saying, they just want to make money. They just want to appease their shareholders and look good and not get in trouble and so they're going to take stuff down if people complain about it and uh, that makes them fucking that makes them shit that makes them have no principles it's why i would not support them over someone like dick masterson who has literally no reason to kick anybody off unless he literally was blocked from every bank and therefore could not transfer anybody's payments which could happen 
but you know it it doesn't have to and there are plenty of people who have shown that like we don't have to make a system that kotos to the interest of you know big corporate media or uh you know platforms like patreon twitter all these other platforms that are deplatforming people all the time to protect their monetary interest we don't have to be you know, subservient to that system, we can be on a system where we can say whatever we want. And I see no reason that anybody should be against being on that system. I don't give a fuck who it platforms. You should be on the system that will protect what you want to say so that you can be sure that they're not coming for you. And there are people who are complaining about me, you know, uh, being upset that Medica got kicked from the platform, even though they're saying that trans people are getting kicked from platforms all the time, that you know, people are being silenced on YouTube, that their videos aren't being promoted, that they're getting demonetized, and people are saying that, but they don't want to promote the platform that will let them say whatever they want? What the fuck are you thinking? Now look, when I first discovered Mr. Medeker, it was because he went on The Dick Show, and he was talking about some of his recent videos that were just kind of about, like, really absurd behaviors that certain people have, such as the uh, sovereign citizens, the people who believe that, uh, you know, they are they are technically not owned by the government because of, so if you don't carry a birth certificate, you're not a, actually a U.S. citizen or something, and therefore they can speed and break all these traffic laws and, uh, you know, and, and, and point to these odd documents they carry around to show police officers. It doesn't work. The point is that they get locked up. It's a stupid belief uh, held by a bunch of crazy people. And, um, you know, Mr. Medica has a video shedding light on that, among other things. Um, but I had checked out his channel. My biggest interest was his series on that guy with the glasses, uh, giving, you know, very fair shakes to the history of each of these creators on this site, talking about, uh, you know, their influence, their importance over time, what made them good in the beginning, how they eventually fell from grace, you know, and just telling the stories of these creators. And of course, you know, we're mocking them, of course. Of course the videos are mocking them because these people made really dumb, stupid, crazy decisions that got them in the predicaments that they're in. And, uh, you know, that I, I don't know how to, how to respond to that with something other than mockery, you know, without to, with other than to point out that they have done something foolish and this is why they are currently suffering and that their inability to recognize this and to admit it to themselves is why they are continuing to suffer. This is the general tenor of Mr. Medeker's videos. Now look, Mr. Medeker's videos are extremely shit-eating. He sounds like he's talking through the biggest grin you've ever heard in your life. And he's kind of untouchable because he's unflappable. He's somebody who is not easy to piss off. He's somebody who rarely talks about his personal life, doesn't have a lot of pictures of himself online. Uh, I don't know if people know his full name. Everybody knows his first name, but he, you know, he's sort of secretive and he's always funny. And the number one rule, if you really want people to like you, is always be funny. Mr. Medeker is hated by a lot of people because of the things that he's chosen to be funny about. But make no mistake, his videos are fucking hilarious. They are... They, they find people who have really, you know, extreme and crazy beliefs, and they make fun of them. Now, the choices of communities that Mr. Medeker chooses to cherry pick from do tend to follow a sort of pattern. And people will draw conclusions about his character on the basis of what, you know, sort of communities he chooses to offend. But you also have to understand something. And I relate to both Medeker and Dick in this regard, that all of us have a sort of line that we recognize in society. We see what is the most controversial place you can be. Where is a position where you can say things that are rational or logical, but you can do so in a way that will, uh, you know, that will piss off the most people possible while also being funny and agreeable to the most people possible. To have, like, the ultimate 50-50 split of how many people are going to think you're hilarious and how many are going to think that you're an asshole. So, like, when you think about men are better than women, 
This is attacking that concept on the broadest possible scale. The book is offensive to half the population, assumably, if it was real. You read the opening part and it literally is an entire page just telling women to put the book down and not read it because it's not for you. It is then like a page and a half of just like insults directed at whatever women happen to be reading until with the women gone, it then, you know, immediately embodies the most preposterous, retarded, goofy male persona imaginable to address the men left in the room. If you read through these two pages and you appreciate the joke, you're in. Doesn't matter what gender you are, anybody could think this is funny. Uh, plenty of women love this book. I've read it to May. She thinks it's hilarious. You know, uh, it's, it's clearly a joke, as I've said before. So what Dick has done here is, you know, again, he's found that exact line. What is the most offensive? What are the things that... It's not that they're the most offensive things you could say. It's that they're the things that would get... Um, the most attention uh, and be like on the biggest platform. So like he got onto the Dr. Phil show, mainstream television to promote this book by using hardcore method acting. And the, the, the thing about getting on the Dr. Phil show is that the stuff he's saying has to be, you know, uh, stuff you can say on TV, stuff that's not so outrageous, so, uh, you know, extreme that, you know, that he wouldn't be able to even be platformed because it would offend too many people too strongly. It has to be kind of obvious that it's a joke. It has, it has to be something you could laugh at because it seems so ridiculous. And if you believe the character is real, then the intention of Phil and, and the creators of the show is to put him on as a freak show because that's what Dr. Phil is. It's a freak show. They bring on people who think crazy shit and we laugh at them and we get mad at them because it's fun to be mad. And so for somebody to pretend to be the most offensive person they could be, but to be so obvious that everybody with a brain keys into it immediately, and the only people who don't appreciate what's happening are the dumb people, then it's like a magical moment. So you really have to understand that when I look at Mr. Medeker, I don't see anything he's saying as really involving his beliefs, or really that he has any particular beliefs, because his videos are mostly just about presenting things that he's found. And yes, the things that he finds are obviously like cherry-picked examples of the most extreme, like crazy elements of specific communities. But we all appreciate that watching the videos. Like, that's the idea. I mean, if you look at the Deviant series, for instance, each episode is about him going down a specific tag. And he'll start by searching the tag, showing how many search results there are, showing the more surface level elements of what you'll find when you search that, which are never nearly as immediate. Well, sometimes if it's like diaper fetish, it's immediately clear. But like, you know, sometimes it's like you don't automatically assume that everything in this tag is crazy extreme, but then he shows you some really weird examples. And I don't think that you can create this kind of stuff and have illusions that what you're doing is normal, you know? And like, th that's fine. Do whatever you want. But like, what is the harm even in somebody pointing this stuff out and, you know, find pointing out the fact that it's abnormal, that it's strange, that, you know, it, it has some, uh, it, it says something odd about your psychology that you are willing to publicly admit to the things that you are saying you enjoy on this website. Like you might have to explain yourself in order for some of these things to, to be accepted, you know, in any way. And I, I think there are plenty of people who can do a good job of that. I think I'm somebody who's been able to, you know, I mean, consider this, I am essentially a lol cow. Like, I am some. I have a very active Kiwi Farms page. You know, I have an Encyclopedia Dramatica article that is not positive. I have uh, tons of haters. I have tons of people who make videos about me, about the things I say. I, you know, and I nonetheless am, you know, in literally good graces of people like Dick Masterson who you know, by all means could decide to, you know, attack me, who could be painting me in the same light as some of the people who he talks about. But the reality is that if you have self-awareness, you don't 
you you are immu- immunized to that because you know dick i can go on his show and he immediately pelts me with you know like pedo jokes because that's the joke and it's funny i appreciate that it is funny what he's saying because it's not just somebody, you know, it's not somebody seriously accusing me of being a criminal, obviously since I'm in his house, but it's somebody poking fun of a thing that I've said that's controversial or in some way, you know, like paints me as a weird guy who has to explain myself. And I'm happy to explain myself if I'm asked any questions, which is what I did when I went on his show, you know, and... uh that's, you know, it's controversial. I've gotten a lot of flack for, you know, just having the opinions I have, but I'm willing to explain myself. I'm willing to, you know, sort out everybody's feelings about anything and let's all come to a fucking understanding by having a conversation, maybe once. Now, when I had first discovered Medeker, as I was talking about earlier, I did kind of shy away from it because I saw what he was doing as edgier, a little bit more bullying sort of content than what I'm interested in. And like, you know, I've been on YouTube for a while. There was this heavy drama culture before it really became politicized. Um, and it, the way that it behaved was essentially the same. It was just talking shit about people who had done weird things, you know? Um, so like, I see how that leads to abuse, especially because the kind of people who are going to watch me occur and who surround him are trolls. I mean, he comes from a troll background, you know, and he may be somebody who all he's ever done is really point out things, just kind of trot things out to, you know, make fun of them. But it doesn't mean that the people he associates with or his sources of information aren't people who are, you know, running ops on people and, and tormenting them, even though I don't think Medeker is necessarily somebody who supports that kind of behavior wholesale, but will just reap the benefits of the fact that it happened. Similar to Dick, who really does not endorse harassing people, but if people are going to harass people, he's going to talk about what comes of it, you know, especially because it's usually interesting. But really what this is all about is that after having watched Medeker's videos, eventually watching a lot of them, and I haven't gone all the way back to the Gamergate days, I, Gamergate was fucking retarded, I have no idea, you know, what his video content was like back then, I don't know if it's stuff that I would find reasonable at all, you know, um... I don't I didn't really consume any of the Gamergate content because I thought the movement was on its face retarded, but, uh, you know, He's done plenty of videos under the Mr. Medeker name that I think are entertaining that I don't think have ever really crossed a line in terms of harassing somebody directly through the content. I really think that, you know, all of his videos could be taken in stride. I don't really think he's even that harsh on the people he talks about. He just kind of points out people doing ridiculous shit. And I mean... I mean, that's what all of our conversations are in our Discord servers anyways. It's just looking at the dumb, crazy shit people are doing online and talking about it with each other, you know? It's just, I guess if it's in a video form now, it's harassment. But the way I see it, any of these people could just as easily have taken, you know, Mr. Medeker's videos as uh, advice, which it often comes off as. So... You know, and they can decide if they think that advice is worthwhile or not for themselves. But it's really not an attack on you to point out that the things that you do are bizarre. I, uh, you know, personally, I would be first to admit that the things I do are extremely bizarre. But I saw this sentiment in my comments saying that, uh, that Mr. Medeker was like a white supremacist or that he courts white supremacists, or that he fucking is involved in this and that, and, like, stuff that I've never seen any evidence for, stuff that I've, you know, I, I see no reason to believe. I definitely think that Mr. Medeker tries to create the edgiest possible content. I think he tries to operate in the, in again, that exact boundary of uh, in-between stuff that most people will see as funny and will not feel like, politically charged by, and that other people will be immediately politically charged by and extremely pissed off about, even though nothing about the content really says anything, uh, really doesn't say much of anything. Most of his content is pretty much just pointing at things people have posted online themselves and maybe just saying, like, yeah, that's odd, you know, that's a weird one, maybe using more aggressive, 
uh, or offensive language than that. But, you know, uh, I think in my experience, most people use more aggressive and offensive language in their casual everyday thoughts on the things they see than, uh, you know, than, than you're allowed to get away with on the internet. But it really, uh, it reminded me of the way that Dick Masterson's been accused of the same thing. And there's people who have t- said that he, like, he platforms Steven Crowder and, like, celebrates his work. And, like, I've investigated this. First of all, because I know Steven Crowder had never been on The Dick Show. And if you don't know who that is, he is a literal white supremacist guy. He's, like, a streamer or something, just one of these talking heads. Uh, he's a dumb asshole who n- nobody probably takes very seriously at this point. But uh, he's also the Nazi who got punched. So if you know about the punching Nazis meme, this is the Nazi who got punched by somebody in the government, I guess. Um, So there you go. That's the punching Nazis guy. And one time he was on the Ralph retort and Dick Masterson said something to the effect of like, you know, I love what you do or something like that. Now, I want you to consider a few bullet points here. First of all, Dick Masterson is constantly making a point to bring people with very crazy ideas onto his show to subtly mock them. He often will invite them to basically, you know, he'll, he'll indulge their stance and allow them to go on and on while, you know, making fun of it or poking holes in the, the, the logic of it or just making fun of the way they come across. That's something he does on his show with all types of people. And it's, it's obvious to me that Dick is being sarcastic when he says this to Steven Crowder, particularly considering who Dick is. We're talking about a guy who has, uh, you know, old videos of him on a piano singing a song called Imagine No Mel Gibson, a, a parody of Imagine where he's just talking about how nice it would be if Mel Gibson, the Jew hater, didn't exist. Uh, you know, he's obviously not somebody who's in support of white nationalism or uh, any kind of racism. He also is half Mexican, and he has often said, uh, as a joke, of white nationalists that he he loves those guys because he wants them to just go make their white nation and fuck off and leave him alone. Go make your ubermensch country that I will not be allowed into because I am not white and go fuck off and die out. Which is hilarious. And yeah, obviously he's not in favor of their stances if he's going to say something like that. But, you know, he thinks that these people are funny and interesting to listen to and that their voice should be out there so we can see how ridiculous they are. And like everybody on Twitter recently was making, including Dick and everybody on his show, were making fun of Steven Crowder for the ridiculous tirade he went on that leaked all over Twitter that uh, literally everybody looked at and went, wow, what a dumb racist idiot asshole who sounds like a fucking wimp. He sounds like such a like, out-of-breath, weird, autistic loser in this rant that everybody just went, ha, what an asshole, you know? Like, I don't feel like this is stuff that should have to be explained. I don't feel like I should have to justify Dick Masterson and explain his comedy and explain his politics so that I can be a fan of him or use his platform. Because... When I was a kid, I was constantly misgendered, and it drove me fucking insane. I looked like a little girl. I in no way wanted to be considered a little girl. People constantly called me ma'am, little girl, or whatever. You know, people were mistaking me for a girl all the time, and I fucking hated it. And I feel exactly the same about that as I do anytime somebody is forcing me to explain what I mean, explain the joke, uh, to, you know, to, to help them along to understanding, you know, the way I'm thinking. Like, it's not that I don't want to do it, especially if you approach it in a way where, you know, you're, you're sincerely interested and just curious and, and want to know more. But if you demand an explanation from me, then it feels like you're you're you know robbing me of the artistry of what I have tried to do in presenting myself. You know, you've I I want to be somebody who can portray intelligence and 
wit and to, you know, to communicate in this artistic way that other people can resonate with. And I want the people who recognize what I'm doing and are entertained by it to to feel energized by my content, you know, and I want to feed off of that energy for myself. And if somebody who doesn't get it, uh, you know, if you don't get it, walk away. If you don't understand what I'm trying to say, don't worry about it. If you really want to know, if you're very curious and you, you're respectful, I will explain to you. But if you, you know, if you just... Uh, if you feel like you deserve an explanation because you don't accept what I'm doing or you, you can't, you're like, Oh, I don't get it. So, uh, you have to explain it to me or else you're not allowed to say it. That to me is that kind of insult. It's like telling me that, uh, you know, I'm not who I am unless I can prove it. It's like, you know, Oh, you're, you're, a, you're saying you're a boy. Well, show me your dick, you know? Like, that's how it feels to me, is, oh, you, that's a joke? Prove how it's funny. Oh, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, that statement's not supposed to be offensive? Well, then, how am I supposed to take it? Don't take it anyway. Just leave me alone. Go away. If you don't, if you don't get it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect you. You know, if you, if you think that what I'm saying is wrong, make a counter-argument, but... You know, in doing so, you will probably have to come to understand what I'm saying. And if you actually analyze what I'm saying, you'll come to realize that it might not be what you thought I meant. That maybe there's another layer to it or some kind of humor to be found in it. And, you know, I also want to present the obvious fact that consuming information does not make you agree with it. For the same reason that Alex Jones could read Mein Kampf and come away with the impression that it was full of crazy shit. For the same reason that I could read the Bible and conclude that it's full of crazy shit. For the same reason that you can read, you know, uh, you can watch one of my videos about autism and say, well, this is full of crazy shit. I don't agree with the things that you've said. Some of it's interesting to think about. Maybe we can have a conversation about it, but I disagree with you and, uh, you know, your presentation of these ideas, uh, I'm going to contest it with the information that I have and attempt to sway the conversation into a direction that paints you as retarded. And I'll say, please do. I, I relish the opportunity to be painted as retarded. It means I will learn something new. It means that my understanding of the world will expand that much more. And in the future, I won't have to say retarded things because I'll have a better understanding. And uh, if I refuse to change my mind and it's obvious I'm doing it because I'm shilling to my audience kill me, you know, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't listen to me. Just abandon, abandon ship. I've gone chill, run away. But, uh, you know, I, I can't, I can't stand the idea that just because you might think that a Mr. Medicare video is funny, that it has no, that, that like, because it's offensive or because it has a position that maybe is deliberate, I mean, obviously his videos are deliberately offensive. Like, the point of his choices of subject matter is to find what will piss off the most people for him to talk about while only stating facts. And it's cherry-picked facts. It's facts that paint an ugly picture. It's facts that you need more context to fully appreciate. But because of the fact that it's facts, it makes for a compelling uh, shit post because it will piss off everybody who, you know, doesn't want information to be presented this way. And it will be extremely funny for everybody who recognizes that that's what the video is doing and that it's going to piss those people off. And that's what makes it funny is the, the fact that it's, it's specifically manufactured in a way to enrage people while being funny and stating interesting facts that regardless of what kind of picture they paint in this video, you can go and research for yourself, expand your knowledge of, come to agree or disagree with for yourself, formulate an opinion on. But, you know, speaking for me personally as somebody who really had never looked into what actually, you know, like what uh, the surgeries look like or what, um, you know, what the bad possibilities were for a transitional surgery, you know, like, 
even if it if it you know it, there's people who are arguing in the comments that most of the time it goes well that most people are satisfied that it's a minority that's dissatisfied it doesn't matter if it's a minority you need to know that some people are dissatisfied you know like i'm not going to take a risk on a 2% chance of failure that's 2 in 100 that's a pretty fucking easy role to make buddy so you know for me personally as somebody who takes very measured risks and sees this as something that uh, has a a lot of very understandable ways that it could go wrong and you know i i i think having seen this when i was younger would have made me you know uh, want to intake more perspectives than the ones that i had intaken at the time in order to learn more about the possibilities and potentials of a you know a future undergoing these decisions but that's just me and I want everybody to have a fucking platform. I do not care what you say. I do not care what you're on about. Uh, if it's intended as a joke, I will think it's funny no matter how crazy it is. And if it's not intended as a joke, I will think it's funny no matter how crazy it is because I'm a rational thinker who can decide for myself what information is valid or not. And even if I find invalid information to be valid and share it, it's very easy to call me out. I'm called out all the time. I'm not a person who people take seriously as an authority on anything other than perhaps anime visuals. Uh, and even then, it's hotly contentious. So, you know, uh, I think we should all have a chance to share our perspectives. That's all I've been saying on every fucking episode of this podcast, but this is a special one just because, man, I've had a bunch of ideas for these things. I keep going like, oh, uh, there was one night where I was going to do the positivity episode. It was going to be the reverse dervish where it was all about a healing experience I had and escaping the whirling dervish for a moment. And uh, it was going to be beautiful. And then I had another idea to do one that's just about Epstein. I could still do that if people want me to do a big old Epstein cast because, uh, man... That's just, I mean, that's like the biggest whirl of them all, right? It's like the biggest, slowest whirling dervish. The one just orbiting in the background behind everything else. Like, this unforgettable uh, story unfolding that every detail of it is automatically interesting. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you want that, let me know. But otherwise, uh, if the dervish is actually whirling, you gotta get in front of a microphone. So, there you are. See you next time. Do you have anything else to say, uh, Pansu Party, the Tard Wrangler? Pokemon Sword and Shield is pretty aight.